Imagine 10 years ago, if someone described to you what the world would look like as we entered the 2020s, would you have believed them? Interesting times, eh? It's about to get a lot more interesting. History will remember this decade as a critical turning point, the end of an era. 2020 was the year that ideas like this went mainstream. Headlines that used to be relegated to the lunatic fringe were now being promoted by the corporate media. Credible economists warning that a banking crisis, a sovereign debt crisis, and ultimately a monetary crisis were on the horizon. Prominent researchers projecting more riots and unrest and potentially a civil war. The UN calling for urgent action to avert a global food emergency. And world leaders warning that military conflict between the United States and China was no longer inconceivable. Then, of course, we had the COVID-19 debacle. Though the authorities would blame the disease itself, it was their ill-conceived response that actually served as the catalyst. Their short-sighted policies initiated a chain reaction. Some of the consequences of this chain reaction are inevitable, like a bullet that's left the barrel of a gun. Others hang in the balance. There will not, however, be any going back to normal. The story has a silver lining, a chance to make the world a better place. But it has to start with an honest assessment of how we got here and point to a positive course of action. In the winter of 2020, as COVID-19 went exponential, a panic was spreading even faster. Borders around the globe slammed shut in rapid succession, and the vast majority of the world's population was placed under some form of curfew or stay-at-home order. Businesses deemed non-essential were shuttered, events canceled, gatherings banned. In some countries, people weren't even allowed to go outside to exercise. The public accepted these policies at first because they were led to believe that they would only last a few weeks. But as weeks turned into months and infections soared in spite of summer temperatures, it became clear that the lockdowns were never going to eradicate this virus. At best, they would slow or delay the spread. And at what cost? Those who hatched this plan had made no provision for a pandemic that would linger on for months or years. They didn't even account for the socioeconomic chain reaction that the first round of lockdowns would set in motion. With businesses shuttered and movement highly restricted, millions were left unemployed virtually overnight. The scale and speed of these job losses broke all previous records. Even the Great Depression didn't come close. By the summer of 2020, Flashpoints of violence and social unrest were beginning to flare up in cities around the world. Pent-up frustrations were building, for obvious reasons. Billions of people had just spent months locked inside their houses. Millions had been thrown into extreme poverty. Most stress-relieving activities had been banned. Social gatherings, sports, time with friends at restaurants or bars, even places of worship were restricted. This was a powder keg waiting for a match. Politicians obviously saw the danger in this equation. When millions of people are suddenly left hungry and homeless, that's a recipe for revolution. Something had to be done, and quickly. So they did something. Boy, did they do something. When all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And the governments around the world were looking at a very, very large nail. The fiscal stimulus programs of 2020 were epic, absolutely off the charts. By June, over 18 trillion had been dispersed globally. Some of the stimulus came in the form of checks sent directly to every single taxpayer. In the US, these checks shipped with an autograph, Donald J. Trump, so you would know who to thank. Unemployment benefits were also expanded in many countries. In the United States, for example, unemployed workers were given an extra $600 a week. This meant that many were earning more staying home than they had been on the job. In fact, personal income in the United States soared by 10.5% in April, the largest monthly increase ever recorded. Then there were the forgivable loans via the Paycheck Protection Program and similar schemes around the world, which were supposed to help prop up small businesses. Some of these loans ended up being extended to some rather strange small businesses. For example, the Church of Scientology got a check, as did the Catholic Church, which landed a nifty $1.4 billion, some of which was distributed directly to dioceses which were facing bankruptcy due to clergy sex abuse settlements. In the UK, 
Their version of the program approved a loan of £340,000 to a company that hosts sex parties for the rich and famous. Seriously, you can't make this shit up. These policies were obviously going to send national debts parabolic, but the reckoning would be delayed, at least for a little while. Central banks played a critical role in this delayed reckoning. As the historic stock market crash of February 2020 was unfolding, the Federal Reserve and their counterparts abroad were swinging their hammers in new and creative ways, injecting liquidity, aka money, into the system via asset markets. If you've never heard of quantitative easing, or QE, you might want to look that up. The short version is that when central banks purchase assets, new money is created. The money that is transferred to the asset holder's account is literally typed into existence. These asset holders typically reinvest this new money, causing asset prices, including stocks, to rise. Poor people don't typically own these kinds of assets, so it's basically welfare for the rich. And while it's wonderful that we can provide such a nice safety net for the upper crust of society, it does have one little side effect. Inflating markets with liquidity creates asset bubbles. It's like filling up a water balloon more and more till it's so big that you can see through it. Sooner or later, it always pops. It also has the effect of increasing wealth inequality, but hey, that's a feature, not a bug. The first round of QE started in 2009, after the housing bubble collapsed. Cutting interest rates to zero just wasn't enough. 2020 brought us round four, affectionately referred to by some as QE infinity. In this round, the Fed would take their liquidity experiment to a whole new level. Buying financial assets never touched during QE 1, 2, or 3, including corporate debt and ETFs. In one month, they purchased more assets than they had during the entire first year following the 2009 crisis. By the end of May, they had over $7 trillion worth sitting on their books. This new money fueled the most powerful stock market rally in history. Retail investors piled in. Even the stocks of companies that had declared bankruptcy were flying high. What could possibly go wrong. With unemployment numbers still hovering at Great Depression levels, and hopes of a quick V-shaped recovery evaporating, all eyes were on governments and central banks. The question was not if there would be more stimulus and money printing, the real question was how big it would be this time. Would it be enough? No one seemed to be asking what would happen if they went too far. Our fearless leaders had painted themselves into a corner at this point. If unemployment benefits, mortgage forbearance, and eviction moratoriums weren't extended, they would soon be facing millions of homeless, hungry, and angry people. With violence and unrest already smoldering in many major cities, this would be like throwing gasoline on a fire. Extending these protections, however, would not be without a price. Eviction moratoriums and mortgage forbearance programs had temporarily prevented millions from being suddenly made homeless. But with no rent coming in, landlords would soon be defaulting on mortgages in mass, as would many homeowners and businesses. This tsunami of defaults and bankruptcies would shake the foundations of the banking system, which would of course prompt further interventions. But as governments and central banks reached for bigger and bigger bailout hammers, a monetary reckoning was rapidly approaching, and the dollar's world reserve currency status was in play. For decades, the dollar's world reserve currency status had enabled Washington to run up its national debt at everyone else's expense and punish any nation that didn't toe the line with unilateral sanctions. This era of exorbitant privilege, however, was coming to an end. A growing hub of powerful countries had been organizing behind the scenes for years. The groundwork for currency insurrection was already laid. Russia and China were the driving forces of this insurrection. For years, both countries had aggressively increased gold reserves and offloaded U.S. debt in a gradual process of de-dollarization. However, in 2018, they crossed the Rubicon. Russia, by launching an alternative to the SWIFT payment system, which allowed countries to bypass U.S. sanctions, and China by introducing the petrol yuan, which would compete directly with the petrodollar. China was also in the process of developing a digital currency that bypassed the need for banks altogether. Transfers relied only on an app on your phone. By July of 2020, China was already testing this new currency at scale. It was only a matter of time before the digital yuan would be competing with the US dollar globally. 
It was this emerging threat to the dollar that motivated Washington to lash out in a series of desperate and ill-conceived provocations. For example, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, which the U.S. Congress passed with a veto-proof margin and was signed by Trump on July 14th, represented a serious escalation. By imposing sanctions on any individual company or bank which did business with Chinese officials enforcing a new security law, this legislation set the stage for Washington to cut China's access to the dollar, a move which would ultimately divide the world into yuan and dollar-based currency blocks. Spoiler alert, doesn't end well for Uncle Sam. These economic provocations were accompanied by multiple rounds of good old-fashioned saber-rattling. On July 13th of 2020, when the Trump administration announced that the U.S. had decided to reject nearly all of China's claims in the South China Sea, what this really meant was that the U.S. was going to intentionally violate airspace and waters around the artificial islands that China had built up in the disputed zone, essentially daring the Chinese to do something. It's worth noting that by this time, these islands were fully militarized and operational, complete with ports, runways, and other facilities that gave the Chinese a clear strategic advantage. At this stage, the rest of the world was beginning to suspect that Uncle Sam was experiencing some form of cognitive decline. He wasn't playing four-dimensional chess here. He didn't even seem to be playing with the full deck. This was like a drunk guy poking a tiger with a stick. Probably not going to end well. The provocations would continue on multiple fronts. Embassies ordered to close, Chinese companies sanctioned or banned from operating in the U.S., anything and everything connected to China was open game. China condemned each of these provocations, but they didn't take the bait. Their response would come when it was in their strategic interest. They would choose their own timing. If direct conflict could be averted long enough, the U.S. was likely to collapse on its own. The war could be won without firing a shot. As often happens when a declining empire is faced with an ascending rival, the United States was rushing headlong into Thucydides' trap. Those in power tend to try to stay in power by any and all means. When all else fails, pick a fight. Would it be China, Iran, some country on Russia's border? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Meanwhile, back in the U.S. of A., the violence and mayhem in the streets was intensifying. Businesses, government buildings, and vehicles had been burning virtually every night for months on end. Protesters and counter-protesters were now bringing semi-automatic weapons to the scene. By September, there were multiple fatalities on each side. Perception of these events was increasingly polarized. The left and the right were no longer behaving like political factions of a nation. They had devolved into hostile tribes fighting for control of a territory. A radicalized strain of thought that directly endorsed violence as a political tool was metastasizing among a new generation of activists. A growing contingent had convinced themselves that they could win in an armed conflict. This was a serious miscalculation. Here humanity approached a crossroad. Probabilities were coalescing as the crisis progressed. Those who saw the stakes would feel an urgency. With every moment of inaction, the likelihood of a tragic ending increased. Something had to be done. But what? What could an ordinary individual do to improve the outcome? Could the trajectory of history really be altered? Some questions are best answered with a riddle. Rather than predicting what comes next, let's tell a story. The story has multiple endings, and you get to choose. It's been said that every nation is three meals away from a revolution. Never before had this principle been tested in so many countries simultaneously as it was in the 2020s. At first, many held on to the hope that everything would soon go back to normal. But as the long-term realities of the decade set in, more and more people would come to the same startling conclusion. The authorities were out of their depth. There was no exit strategy. The situation was not under control. In the early stages of the crisis, when the first few governments were collapsing, very few realized how the conflux of economic, geopolitical, and social variables were coalescing as a perfect storm. But when G20 nations started dropping like flies, the phenomenon became impossible to ignore. Like dominoes falling, the collapse of one major economy destabilized every country connected to it. In the age of globalization, very few would be spared. What began as a trickle suddenly accelerated as the downfall of the U.S. dollar precipitated an unprecedented shock 
to global supply chains. Imports ground to a halt around the world. In countries dependent on outsourced food production and manufacturing, this translated into widespread shortages and social unrest. In this environment, extremist movements of all stripes flourished. A small handful of nations would weather this storm peacefully. Rather than tearing themselves apart from within or transforming into totalitarian dictatorships, they would unify and adapt. As economic and monetary shocks disrupted global supply chains and trade, these countries would quickly reorganize their economies to replace imports with local production, starting with food and essentials. Reducing dependence on fossil fuels was an important element of this transition. To accomplish this feat, every aspect of modern life was reimagined. Lawns were replaced by gardens, golf courses converted to orchards, waste streams were recuperated to minimize losses. It wasn't easy, but these countries pulled through, and before the decade was over, they were building regional trade networks that hadn't existed before the crisis. A lot of wealthy countries didn't do so well in the second phase of the crisis, the part where a real hardship kicked in. Populations accustomed to easy living and constant entertainment had a very short fuse. As shortages and rationing became the new normal and homeless encampments grew, protests would morph into riots, armed uprisings, and civil wars. Governments that were ill-prepared for these challenges crumbled quickly, some into the hands of populist movements, others to military juntas. In most cases, the replacement was more brutal and repressive than the old system. The underlying paradigm was rarely questioned at all. Many regimes would extend their lifespans by totalitarian means, Emergency powers established under lockdown would prove invaluable here. Policies previously justified by public health would now be implemented in the name of national security. Control mechanisms adapted and repurposed to crack down on dissidents. It was every petty dictator's wet dream, granular control over every aspect of human behavior and interaction. No one allowed to gather without permission, every contact tracked and traced. If you're outside, you better be prepared to show your papers. This approach was most effective when the latent fears and hatreds of a population could be rallied against an enemy. Convince the people that they are under attack, and it's easy to unify them under a flag. Rather than rioting in the streets, impoverished youth can be conscripted into the military. Their identities shattered and remolded, conditioned to obey, trained to kill on command. Send them abroad to steal land and resources, use them at home to crush dissent. War is, after all, the health of the state. Regardless of which axis prevailed in these conflicts, the result would be the same. A new totalitarian order was the universal prescription, the only cure for the chaos. The world's first truly global currency would replace the dollar. This currency would be completely digital, coins and banknotes phased out. Every single transaction conducted using this currency would be recorded on a blockchain. Unlike the original cryptocurrencies, this blockchain was controlled by a central authority and monitored with AI. Economic privacy was a thing of the past. It was the holy grail of the ruling elite, the precursor for global governance with teeth. But before they even had time to properly congratulate themselves, their house of cards was catching wind. As living conditions deteriorate and fear and uncertainty prevail, certain psychological forces are always unleashed. These forces are like the incoming waves of a tsunami. Once they gather momentum, there can be no stopping them. Throughout history, there have been individuals and movements who rode these waves, channeling the tides of human sentiment towards a course of action. Though the science of crowd psychology is complex and nuanced, the application of its principles is mind-bogglingly simple. So simple, in fact, that intellectuals typically recoil from them, while bona fide idiots wield them easily into great effect. Like riding a tsunami on a surfboard, attempting to redirect the momentum of a society is highly dangerous. The crowd can lift a leader to great heights, but one mistake can leave them hanging from a lamppost. Those who manage to navigate these forces usually guard the formula carefully. Failure to do so would threaten the foundations of their power. This time around, however, humanity flipped the script. In the age of the internet, the science of crowd psychology and color revolutions had been available to the public for some time now, but very few saw the utility in studying it. However, as the 2020s progressed and it became more and more clear that those in power were pushing civilization towards a dystopian nightmare, 
A contingent of activists would reverse engineer the tools being used against them. The work of Gustave Le Bon and Edward Bernays would be modernized and tempered with the cultural code, the positive application of human instinct. The instinctual psychology of our species can be harnessed for good or for evil. In the modern era, it has been weaponized by the military-industrial complex for regime change and by corporations for marketing and public relations. The same principles, however, can be applied to create rather than destroy. Visions and values can spread like viruses from mind to mind and from place to place. The contagion of a single idea can inspire generations towards a new paradigm. Topple a government is surprisingly easy when conditions are right. Silver spoon politicians who've never worked a day in their life can easily lose the respect and obedience of military and law enforcement. When that happens, it's game over. The question that always comes up in such events, usually as an afterthought, is what will you replace the old system with? There is nothing more dangerous than armed men with utopian dreams. Sometimes a cure can be worse than a disease. History provides many cautionary tales. To avoid the trap of oppressed rising up to become the oppressor, the paradigm that facilitates this dynamic has to be questioned. The vast majority of modern governments, businesses, and organizations utilize a social structure called vertical collectivism. Vertical collectivism is a top-down system of organizing human groups which amplifies power by stacking layers of authority in pyramids. The result is a highly stratified society where those on the bottom have little or no say and are left to fight over the scraps from above. Vertical collectivism is apolitical. Capitalist companies and communist regimes both use it without contradiction, as do republics that call themselves democracies. The vertical model was born of military strategy. A general or warlord alone can only control a small army, but by using subordinate officers and layers of rank, a single individual or a small ruling class can dominate millions of people in vast territories. This is why a state is often defined as the monopoly on violence within a region. Vertical collectivism didn't spread to every corner of the globe because it improved people's lives. In fact, Modern anthropologists acknowledge that the transition to this way of life was associated with reduced life expectancy and a decline in virtually all measures of health up until very recently. Vertical collectivism spread like a cancer because it is brutally effective in the context of war. Every culture that it encountered was either crushed on the battlefield or forced to copy the model to survive. The dawn of civilization, as many euphemistically refer to it, is a story of conquest and colonialization that began approximately 10,000 years ago and continues to this day. This was not, however, the beginning of the human story. For over 300,000 years, long before the first empires of Asia and Europe began to absorb surrounding tribes, humans organized themselves using a very different model. Rather than building top-down stratified societies that concentrated wealth and power in the hands of an upper class, these cultures organized horizontally. Organizing horizontally didn't mean that there were no leaders. The authority and conformity instincts are far older than humanity. Like all social animals, our species is hardwired to follow those who demonstrate courage and intelligence. However, in horizontal societies, disparities of wealth and power were significantly smaller. The leaders and councils responsible for group decisions were not insulated by armies and law enforcement conditioned to obey without question. Defense and order were maintained by an armed citizenry bound by a code of conduct. This dynamic forced leaders to be directly accountable to the population. Their power was rooted in their ability to communicate with the people, build consensus, and chart a course of action to the benefit of all. The fact that horizontal societies required leaders to work with the public in such a personal way had one obvious disadvantage. It limited the size of the group. After all, why would someone voluntarily follow someone far away that they had never met? There is, however, a way around this limitation. By forming federations, Horizontal societies can expand their sphere of influence significantly. An example of this adaptation can be found in the Iroquois Confederacy, which unified five tribes for hundreds of years in the region that came to be called New York. Each member tribe in the Confederacy had their own culture and internal governance, but a set of shared values enabled them to cooperate economically and militarily. If one tribe was attacked, they quickly mounted a common defense. Many historians believe that the United States federal system was based on the Iroquois model. One significant difference, however, was that the Iroquois had no central government. There was a central council comprised of representatives from each tribe, 
but this council had no power to enforce its will. Each representative was tasked with building a consensus that would resonate with their people. A modernized adaptation of this Iroquois model gained traction in the mid-2020s as the gears of globalization ground to a halt. While governments proved incapable of solving the most basic problems, decentralized networks were replacing the system from the ground up. They would start by organizing local food production in their communities and gradually expand cooperation to other sectors. Their revolution was driven by an idea worth spreading. Not only was it possible to live on this planet without destroying it, this way of life was more abundant and more fulfilling than the alternative. There was no need to wait for governments to act. Humans were perfectly capable of organizing themselves. Those that succeeded became epicenters of a new renaissance, attracting skilled workers and artists from around the world. Some of these travelers would put down permanent roots. Others would return to their homeland to plant seeds of their own. From the fragments of fallen empires, new nations would be born. From the ashes of dying cultures, new cultures would rise. The great collapse of the 2020s was not the end of the world. It was the end of an era and the dawn of a new one. Remember how we said this story has multiple endings? We're going to take one of them to a literal extreme, and we're going to do it in the real world. Now, if you're living in a crowded city center, maybe pushing the boundary starts by planting a garden in your front yard, organizing a community compost, or speaking out against a war. However, it's important to understand that in the era that we have entered, the stakes are rising, and the trajectory we're on needs to be altered significantly. This implies fundamental changes in the way we live, not just gestures in the right direction. You have to decide what kind of story you and your family want to be a part of. In some cases, this might involve immigrating to another country. Others will be more inclined to stay and fight to change the outcome at home. One way or the other, you'll want to be in a place where you can grow food, and you'll want to be set up to do this without agrochemical inputs or fossil fuels. You also don't want to be reliant on the grid. Utilities can and will go down. Some will be shocked by how long they can stay down. These aren't the kind of lifestyle changes you want to make at the last moment, or put off until you can do something large scale. Far better to start transitioning to a new way of life right now. Do what you can with what you have. Join forces with others to amplify. The learning curve for this kind of transition can be steep. There are a lot of practical skills that we should be taught in school, but aren't. Most kids when they graduate don't know how to build a house, or grow a garden, or even how to make bread. The best way to learn this stuff isn't really in a classroom anyway. People learn best by example, anchored with hands-on experience. That's why we built this place. You could think of it as an experiential learning center slash makerspace. This whole landscape is a laboratory. Here we can put ideas to an extreme test. Rather than just reading about this stuff or watching a presentation, volunteers and travelers from all over the world come here to try it themselves. They get their hands dirty in the field, planting plants, working with animals, building crazy structures like these. They also get to experience firsthand what it takes to self-organize and live in a different way. The experience is extreme because the challenges we face are real. We're completely off grid here. Our electricity comes from the sun. We have running water by pumping from the spring up to a tank on the hill. It's also up to us to maintain the road and the drainage. Up here, when there's a problem, we have to put our heads together and find a way to solve it. To put this in perspective, our first long-term volunteer was here when we sustained a direct hit from Hurricane Maria. He also assisted in the recovery and became part of the story. Talk is cheap. If you really want to change the world, you have to be able to show people how. We're doing this here in the Commonwealth of Dominica because these people are moving in the right direction and their culture holds some of the keys to the solution. But wherever you decide to make your stand, now is the time to get serious about food security. Our challenge in the next phase is to grow more and develop local production systems to replace imports. Some will have a chance to collaborate on site. Others will integrate this information and use it creatively, writing themselves into the story in unpredictable ways. You'll find sources, links, and bonus footage at stormcloudsgathering.com. If you pay close attention and pause often, you'll discover Easter eggs. If you agree with this message, it's up to you to make it spread. But rather than just clicking the share and like buttons, take a few minutes to download the video and make a copy.
Rather than just sending a link to your friends, sit people down and watch it with them. You have permission to present or distribute this content through any medium or venue. Speaking of venues, in this age of algorithmic censorship, we've been forced to develop a new distribution strategy. If you want to keep in touch with us, you can now subscribe to our Telegram channel, at Stormclouds Gathering. We've also created a Telegram group you can join, at the Resilience Network, to connect with others working on projects in the real world. You can also sign up for email notifications on our website. We want to end by saying thank you to those who donated to support our work. Because of you, we were able to get new solar panels, batteries, and components, which enable us to power these facilities. We can even run a washing machine and a fridge now. In this next phase, we are building and purchasing equipment for food production and processing. If you want to help pull this project forward, you can donate at stormcloudsgathering.com forward slash donate.